So it's Raphael Johnson's turn as we go one-on-one in another episode of the Balls Deep Fantasy Basketball Podcast, uh, chatting with analysts, talking about life away from the court. Let's go Balls Deep. Welcome to another episode of the Balls Deep Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Fantasy Basketball International. FBIBasketball.com is the website. At AdamKing91 on Twitter is where you'll find me. So we're continuing our uh, interview one-on-one analyst series. We don't really have a formal name for it. As I said, we've got Raphael Johnson from uh, NBC Sports Edge, Roto World. I still call it Roto World. Um, Raphael, how are you, mate? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Yeah, good, good. Uh, It's a nice dignified time for me. It's a little bit later in the evening for you, um, Mm -hmm. but that's usually the case when I Mm -hmm. do these interviews, talking with you guys over there in the States. Um, So you are with uh, NBC Sports Edge still. There was obviously a bit of a uh, a changing of the guard in November. Um, Mm -hmm. You were one of the, the ones, along with Zach... Uh, Noah, I think it sort of stuck around there. Um, So sort of lead off these discussions by talking to people about, well, firstly, whether fantasy basketball, writing and podcasting, that sort of thing is a full-time job or a part-time job. It's a a bit of a mixture, as you would know, across Mm -hmm. all of the analysts. Some people uh, are able to do it as a full-time job to, to earn a living where some of us like me, it's, it's sort of just a hobby that's gone too far. Yeah. So for you, <laughs> is, is, is this a full-time, uh, full-time gig? It's a full-time gig. You know, uh, I'm certainly grateful for that. You know, as you noted, we had a lot of change in November where a lot of people who put a lot of years into this thing were, were laid off. And, you know, That made for an interesting season, to say the least. Not only what was going on, like, on the court and what we had to watch and all that, but, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Still here, you know, given all the the changes. That's no small thing to say. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. It was a full-time deal. And I know, like, having done a lot of blurb writing with Rotowire and Mm -hmm. um, Sports Ethos, like, I know how much time goes into writing those player blurbs. And and I guess my initial thought was when – when they sort of thinned it out a bit and there were only a few of you left, God, you must have done a lot of blurb writing. Um, I'll well, put it like was, this. Whoever was yeah. doing it. It was basically the three of us, myself, uh, Noah and Zach. And for me personally, as the one full-timer left, a day off for me was probably when I worked a single shift instead of a double. <laughs> so, yeah, a lot went into it. Um, there are some of those games, some of those nights we have like 11 or 13 games on the schedule. Yeah. You're just kind of counting down the games until you're <laughs> done. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's full on. Um, and so for, in terms of where you are now, a full-time mm-hmm. analyst, how did this sort of come about? Was this a, a job that you was sort of always the plan or was it something you fell into following a career, doing something else? I fell into it. Um, I started I, when I went to college. I was a chemistry major to start. That really did not work out because it was like organic chemistry, and I did not agree for one and two. I started <laughs> to ask myself, do I want to spend the next thirty to forty years of my life in the lab? And the answer was no. Um, I'd always been a huge sports fan, you know, followed it, wrote about it some, decided to change paths, and I started on the college basketball path. To be honest with you, um, okay. so. So that's how I got my introduction, a website that no longer exists, collegehoops.net. That's where I started. Eventually parlayed that into a job with NBC uh, for the old college basketball talk page. And that was kind of a, it went full time, then it was dropped back down to part time. Um, And then I was able to pick up some extra, you know, NBA stuff, uh, mainly NBA draft type things for the Roto World page. And they eventually said, you know, we like what you do. We like, you know, your work ethic. Would you like to give this a try over here? More opportunities, you know, and and at that point, you're still kind of focused on, I need to put food on my table. So 
yeah. and college basketball wasn't really doing it at the time. So to be able to do that and eventually get on with those guys full time for a bit, and then you know the pandemic happened and things were cut back down. Then we went back up. It was kind of a yo-yo effect, but yeah. So I started out college basketball, shifted over to fantasy NBA out of necessity, man. I'm glad I did it. I really enjoy it. It's been really great to get to know you and a bunch of other guys in the in the industry and and see different approaches to to how this thing is covered. Yeah, and I think coming in, I mean, everyone I've spoken to have all had different paths and, and different sort of steps to where they are now. But I think coming in through that college basketball pathway is probably, in hindsight, a, a really good way of doing it because of. Mm -hmm. Like especially at this time of the season, obviously yeah. during not not as much, but now with the shift sort of foc the focus shifting to dynasty a little bit more, mm -hmm. and you would have just that innate sort of knowledge and, and experience of of having followed college basketball and knowing where to look, what to look for. So that's mm -hmm. that's I mean that must be a positive, I would think. Yeah, it does help. I think I had to learn. I have to understand the differences between the pro and the college game. They're vastly different yeah. as you, as you obviously know. So it's like some of the things that you kind of get used to seeing in college basketball, they may not necessarily translate to the NBA level. Um, so I think when it comes to not just evaluating dynasty leagues with single season leagues, like how early should you draft rookies? Um, I think the Victor Wimbanyama question is going to be one that we're going to be debating for, <laughs> For a few months now in terms of where he should be drafted in fantasy leagues. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I think I, I agree with you in terms of, you know, that having that that background really helps. But there's also some things you kind of have to know how to separate, too. Yeah. And and I think, I mean, even this, this morning when I when I got up and there was a, a tweet or a sort of a, a – um, a thread there from Noah talking about some advanced stats and, and yeah. looking at block rates and steal rates. And, and the thing I pulled out from that was that Walker Kessler is going to be really good, <laughs> yes. um, which we've, we've already seen to some mm -hmm. degree. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I've got him pretty high in my rankings for next season. Mm -hmm. um, so outside of, of fantasy, um, I mean, most of the people that I've spoken with have families, young families except except for dr a who i spoke with yesterday he's got yeah. he's got an older family um mm -hmm. so for you what what are you sort of what what does your life look like when you're not not that you have much free time i'm sure at the moment mm -hmm. but when you're not writing blurbs and writing articles what is, what does life look like for you in terms of family and and weekends and free time yeah, it's just me um so i don't have like a wife or kids or anything like that but yep. i spend a lot of my time you know, exercising, you know, listening to music, sneaker collecting to a certain extent. Um, it, it's pretty boring, to be honest with you. you know, I, <laughs> I kind of like it that way. I'm not too big into the drama of being out every weekend. If basketball is on or or soccer, um, there's pretty much can find me in front of a TV at that point. So, yeah. Yeah. And and so, I mean, you soccer, um you've said you're, you're interested in, and I think, I mean, if anyone who listens to you when you're on um, round ball mm -hmm. stew and that sort of thing, can, there's always hints like that uh, about yeah. what other sports you like. So soccer is one. Are there any other sports that you're sort of particularly passionate about? Um, it used to be boxing, but I think the way in which that sport has gone over the years kind of fallen out of, out of touch with it to a certain extent. Um, I still watch the big fights and what have you, but, that's not something that I religiously follow like I did when I was younger. Um, you know, in terms of the other sports like baseball, that that'll be more from like a fantasy slash DFS angle yeah. that I follow them as opposed to like having favorite teams or whatnot. But in terms of my teams, it's basically AC Milan or the Knicks. So yeah, that's pretty okay. much it for me. And I'm and I've pulled you away from watching the Knicks game, so I appreciate yeah. it. <laughs> it's um, all good. <laughs> um yeah, soccer's not really. I guess it was it, growing up. Did you were you sort of a, a player, like a, an athlete? A, a, mm -hmm. You you participated in sports, and was soccer one of those? Yeah, I played multiple sports as a kid. Um, in terms of like the soccer slash AC AC Milan collect, uh, connection, I grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, and I, I don't know if this was because of the south, the Italian community on the south end. 
But we had access to Rai TV, and I didn't know what language they were speaking. They're obviously speaking Italian, but I'm watching Sunday mornings, and I see red and black shirts, guys like Rude Hullet, uh, Marco Van Basten. That's how I kind of began to root for AC Milan. But in terms of the other sports I play as a kid, pretty much the American experience. You play baseball, yeah. play basketball. Didn't play football until I decided on a whim sophomore year of college to try out as a walk-on. And I somehow made the team. Um, but I went through that season, but I that was it. So I think for me, like I know base baseball's obviously a big part over there yeah. for a lot of kids and mm-hmm. it's a sport that I just can't get into. But that's because we don't have it here in australia yeah. i mean it's we have it, it's played but it's not a, a big sport by any means mm-hmm. um and I, I think the the equivalent would be potentially cricket for you yeah. guys um because cricket can go for five days so <laughs> mm-hmm. that's a it's obviously really yeah. long um so yeah okay so sport um you stay healthy in terms of, I mean, I love TV. I love watching TV shows, movies. I, I go to try to go to the movies at least once a week with some friends. Um, is that something that sort of you enjoy doing as well in any downtime? Like any particular TV shows or, or movies that come to mind that you like? I, yeah, I tend to binge, binge watch TV shows. I think right now, um, Wu Tang and American Saga just wrapped up. So, and to catch up on that, and then Snowfall. I watched those are like the recent shows. Um, yeah, I think favorites like The Wire. Um, I guess Breaking Bad was another one I liked a lot. But you know, I think I tend to watch. I don't really watch too much in terms of like TV or movies. Like if I find a show that I like, I'll definitely yeah. stick with it. But it, I spend so much time watching basketball. I think <laughs> that's probably where the whole relationship factor comes into play. Like if I was married or in a serious relationship, my TV choices would probably be a bit broader than they currently are. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. At the moment, you only have to watch what you want to watch. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, and, and I'm, well, I guess lucky, unlucky. I don't know how you would look at it, but my wife doesn't like TV at all. Uh-huh. So <laughs> I don't have to cater to her when I watch TV. I just, mm-hmm. I watch um, once she's in bed and once the kids are in bed, I just go for it and watch whatever I want to watch. And Whereas I have friends who will have to wait for their they, like they need to watch the shows together, so they have to wait and watch it at a certain time. And then that's mm-hmm. I'm glad I don't have to do that. Yeah. Um. It, now, in in terms of travel, is that are you a big sort of traveler? Do you like getting out and about around the world, around America? Is that something that you've done, or something that you'd like to do into the future? I'd like to do more of it. Um, I haven't done too much, you know. Like I said, I'm, I'm a pretty boring person, um, to be honest with you. So I don't really do too much travel right now, but I like to get to Vegas, you know, go go back to New York, um, Connecticut, that part of the country, whenever I get the chance. But I'm more of a homebody. Yeah. Okay. And, and yeah, look, that's, God, I love being at home. So yeah. um, I do like traveling, but coming home is the best part. Agreed. Um, <laughs> and so you're, so you're a Knicks fan. So whereabouts are you based at the moment? In New York? I'm actually based in Tucson, Arizona. Okay. That's what yeah, that's where I went to school. So went to University of Arizona. So Yeah, okay. But um growing up yeah, growing up in the Northeast, that's how I got the uh the connection to them. Yeah, okay. And and so f- I mean I don't know where things are geographically in America, but I know the states and so I know that Arizona is Phoenix. Or yeah. Phoenix, Phoenix is Arizona. Yeah. So do you get to go to to are you close to where the Suns play? Like two hours away, um, two okay. hours to the southeast. So every once in a while, I get up there. But like this year, that was like a lost cause just because of the work situation. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. Okay. And and but you you and you said you like to get to Knicks games. So you've I'm assuming you've been to Madison Square Garden. Oh, yeah. Between <laughs> Knicks games and in the Big East tournament, I've been to Madison Square Garden enough times. Yeah, I my think, life. Uh, yeah. I think if there's one, I mean. I'm headed to the States later in the year, um, mm. probably not to, to New York, but 
I would think that that would be one place I'd like to go, yeah. Madison Square Garden. Like it just, I think the history and, and that sort of thing there as well. So that yeah. that must have been pretty pretty exciting. And and I've got a the friend I'm going with actually. He's been to a, a couple of um, like March Madness tournaments, that sort of thing in yeah. the states when he's there. And he mm-hmm. said the the um, atmosphere was incredible at, at those games. Yeah. So um, if you, I mean, you've been to to both. For I mean, a lot of people listening who who would be in the states may have been to NBA or college, but a lot of people here in Australia or Europe, wherever, um, probably haven't. For you, what's the biggest difference in terms of atmosphere, crowd, going to to an NBA game as opposed to a a college game or, or even a March Madness game? Yeah, I think it's the atmosphere for sure. It's like your standard NBA game. A lot of it just feels manufactured, you know, with like the piped in music and uh, yeah. the timeout activities and what have you. You don't have as much of that in the college game. So that would be the biggest difference, I, I would say. Um, and also, I think with pro games, you tend to get more people from like visiting teams going to mm. these games. Um, college, you may have may like have a section of friends and family, some other people sitting behind a visiting bench. You don't see too much of that unless it's like a neutral site like the NCAA tournament or your conference tournament, something like that. So I think that would be the other difference as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. And for you, would there be is, – is one better? Like, which, If you had to pick one, if you could go to an NBA game yeah. or, or a college game, which would you lean towards? Man, that's a good question. I think it all depends on the time of season. You know, like yeah. end of the year, I would probably lean NCAA tournament just because, you know, it's a one-and-done scenario. And you're, you're at a site where you have either four or eight teams playing. So yeah. there's a big difference between just two and the NBA. I think if you get, like, conference finals, NBA finals, and I think the NBA would, would win. But other than that, I think I'd probably prefer a college game, to be honest with you. Yeah. I know watching it just on TV, the the – the passion of the college fans is yeah. insane. Like it's, it's mm-hmm. next level compared to uh, compared to the NBA. So, um, so this isn't a fantasy podcast, obviously. But one conversation that I'm having with everyone is something you mm-hmm. alluded to a little bit earlier, and that's Victor Wembanyama for next yeah. season. Um, now, I've put I've put my rankings out already. Uh, I've got I've got Victor Wembanyama. I think in the mid 30s from memory. Yeah. Um, that could change. There's obviously a long, a long time, or a, a lot of water to go under the bridge between now and, and next season. But for you, two-part question: If we were draft, if you had to draft now for next season, where would you be comfortable taking Wembenyama? And the second part of the question is based on hype and, and everything we're hearing. What do you think his ADP is going to look like next season? Yeah, I think. I would think the back end of the third round. So maybe like 30 to 36, if not early fourth is where I would take him. Um, you know, I think ADP wise, I think that's going to be about what it's going to be. Um, you, you're going to have your casuals who may jump for him early, obviously. But I think in terms of the more savvy fantasy managers, so we don't know what the draft lottery is. That's the, the most no. important thing right now, but. I think the more savvy fantasy managers would probably be comfortable waiting for him in a third round or so. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I'm sort of a of a mindset, or and much like with um, I don't know. There's always a few players every year that I'm sort of resigned to the fact that I'm probably not going to get them on my team because yeah, someone's going to reach. Like someone in my league is going to reach <laughs> up for him, and, and I think Wembenyama will be that guy next season. Um, in saying that, I. I I really would want to have him on our team somewhere. So I'll probably yeah. just go in enough draft only leagues until I can get him. Um, Dr. A, who I, who I spoke with, well, I spoke with him yesterday. I don't know what the order I'm releasing these is, but mm-hmm. um, if, if he's hasn't been released yet, spoiler alert, he, he is looking at taking Wimbanyama <laughs> possibly at the back end of the first round, early second round. Mm-hmm. Um, but we know Dr. A is that, that that's who he is. Like if he's got his yeah. guys that he wants, he just gets them. He doesn't care. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Public perception doesn't really matter to him. So, um, yeah, I think like you sort of said there, I think there will be those people that will reach for him. But the more, I guess, the more people that are listening to podcasts and reading and and actually 
studying and preparing for, for fantasy drafts. I think all of the information that will be coming out from, from us and, and from most analysts will be that, yeah, you probably don't want to reach into the second round to get him. Yeah. Um, third round would be better. In terms of the draft, do you think, like for you, is there a preferred landing spot for him in terms of fantasy? Well, I guess maybe two parts in terms of real life progression and development and the ability to, to ease his way in and then from a fantasy perspective as well. I just hope he doesn't wind up in Houston or Detroit um, <laughs> because I, I'm not really sure what's going on. Well, obviously both franchises are looking for a new head coach as we speak. Um, but even before that, the way in which they've handled their respective rebuilds, I would rather Victor not wind up in either of those situations. Um, I feel, I don't know, for some reason, I don't, I'm not a big believer in like karma or what have you, but I just have a feeling he's going to wind up in San Antonio. Um, just kind of like that last great player, that great project that Greg Popovich um, yeah. has the coach before he goes out, rides out into the sunset at some point. But I think that would be interesting to watch, but just please know Detroit or Houston. That's all I ask. Yeah, I I mean, yeah, I think new both teams need new coaches. I think that's yeah pretty mm-hmm. obvious. But you you also have to wonder about how how much of that decision or poor decision making comes from above the coach. So it's it's yeah. not necessarily the coach making that call. So it's all very well and good getting a new coach, but if the management and and the owners that sort if they're still that same mindset, then the coach is only sort of free to do so much so Mm -hmm. um yeah i think from a development standpoint i think spurs would be really good just because of the structures they've done it before they've proven they can do it before whereas detroit and houston have just looked like a shambles for the last (laughs) few years um i'd like charlotte i don't i don't know i mean obviously the the Rockets, Pistons, and Spurs have the best odds, but mm-hmm. uh, it is flattened out a bit now with all the new percentages and the way it works. So I wouldn't mind the Hornets, um, and I wouldn't mind the, mind the Magic as well, but yeah. they're, they're more long shot than, than guaranteed. Mm-hmm. So, um, so look, that that'll. I mean, we, we can put a bow on that for today uh, it, with the the off season coming up and, and dynasty and that sort of thing. Obviously the the player blurbs have slowed down, which is good. But what are the plans for uh, Sports Edge and and yourself, sort of over the next couple of months leading into the NBA draft and then into okay. summer league? Uh, what yeah. Are, what are you uh, well, the last couple of weeks we've been doing some roundtable type things, some just season wraps. Um, I'm not sure exactly when you're going to re- release this, but as of April 18th, our most recent one was picking some breakout candidates for next mm-hmm. season. So we're doing that um, in a couple of days. We're going to have a our own rankings, like top 24 players heading next season, which at this point, if we're being honest, kind of like throwing darts at a dartboard. You yeah. know? <laughs> so we'll have that. And then eventually we'll get into pre-draft stuff in terms of mock drafts and things of that effect heading into the NBA draft in late June. Yep. No, I think that, yeah, I mean, that's all people can really expect. That, mm-hmm. That's why we're doing these podcast that's why i mean i've done my rankings and as you said it, it is very hit or miss at this yeah. point in the season um but there seem to be more and more people that that aren't stepping away from fantasy like there, there are still those that once the fantasy season is done that's it they mm-hmm. they take three months off and they they move away from twitter and they move away from listening to podcasts but i've noticed that despite the end of the season I'm still getting new people finding our stuff through through yeah. Twitter, that sort of thing. So I think there are more and more people that are, are just, well, maybe they just lead sad lives like us. And, hey, man. <laughs> it's, it's good, though. You know, it's good to kind of not – I wouldn't say so much keep this, this whole fantasy basketball thing alive, but at least keep it fresh, mm-hmm. um, keep it in people's minds because – Hey, why not? If fantasy football can be a 12-month type deal, why can't fantasy basketball be the same thing, you know? Yeah, and I know for me, like before I got into, obviously when you're an analyst, you, you have to stay in it. So you can't yeah. really step mm-hmm. away completely for three months. But I know when 
when I was just playing sort of casually and, and you do have those few months off to then come back in quite a lot actually changes. And so you've actually yeah, got to then go back and, and <laughs> see what's happened and why is this, ha- this player doing this? And whereas if you can just at least keep your foot in the door and just stay aware of what's happening. So I think that's really good. And I think a few of us are, are catching on and, and just yeah. continuing to churn out some content. So yeah, um, so, yeah, that, that will do it. Thank you for jumping on. I'll let you sort of get back to, to watching the Knicks there. I don't know. I think it was pretty even when, when we started. Yeah. I don't know what the score is now. So, um, yeah, we'll probably oh. have you on again. Oh, you just checked the score? Yeah, Cleveland's up 12 early second quarter. So Okay. All right. Well, we'll see. Knicks got one in, in Cleveland, so they'll probably yeah. at least take that. Um, so that will do it for today's show. Remember, you can check out all of our content at fbibasketball.com. Uh, Matt Lawson, uh, by the time this comes out, he'll have his dynasty show up and running, uh, all of his dynasty ranks. Um, he's got a ton going on at the moment, actually. Uh, we'll have our – my player ranks will continue to be updated. Um, you can follow this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Give us a thumbs up, subscribe, and like. And until next time, catch up. You just listened to another episode from the Fantasy Basketball International Podcast Network. Thanks for joining us. And for more information about joining our community, please check out our website at fbibasketball.com.